So welcome everybody to the idea seminar. I am del absolutely delighted today to introduce our speaker. Uh, I've known him for a while, we're old friends. Uh, and our speaker is Michael Seamus. He is a, a distinguished career professor in the School of Computer Science. And what makes Michael really wild as a speaker is that he also has a PH, not only a PhD from Yale in computer science, but he also has a JD for, from Duquesne University. So he's both a computer scientist and a lawyer. He is a member of the Bar of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and the Supreme Court of the United States. For 23 years, he's conducted examinations and computerized uh, voting systems for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and he's personally participated in over 120 voting system certifications for eight states. He also is a renowned educator and has developed multiple master's programs in the School of Computer Science. So with that being said, I want to leave the most time for him to speak, so I will turn it over. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Kathleen. Um, so I never thought I would have to give this talk. Uh, because even though voter fraud is quite old, uh, we've never before really had fraud in voter fraud. That is, false assertions that, that voter fraud has occurred. And when I say voter fraud is very old, um, I, I did a historical review of New York Times articles uh, some years ago. The New York Times began publishing in the 1850s. From the 1850s until now, the New York Times has published an average of one article every 12 days on voter fraud. So voter fraud does exist, and we're going to talk about when it exists and how you find it and when it doesn't exist and how you can tell the difference between uh, truth and falsity. And so um, there we go. Uh, I have a, an alternate title for this talk that I didn't want to put on the, on the announcement, uh, and that title is Living in a Post-Truth Era. The post-truth era refers to a time period in human history when truth doesn't seem to matter, that people only want to hear what they want to hear or they want to hear what they would like to believe. And so I'm going to try to indicate why in the voting field uh, we've moved away from the, an era where truth mattered to an era where truth doesn't really seem to matter anymore. I'll give you some examples. So here are cases of fraud in voter fraud. After we talk about those, I'll show you some cases of actual voter fraud. So these are cases of fraudulent claims of voter fraud. And uh, this, one, this one's quite famous. So uh, Tom Fitton is a conservative activist, president of something he calls Judicial Watch, uh, and has, uh, is known for having sued climate scientists uh, for uh, alleging falsely that there's climate change. And so right after the election in 2020, uh, he sent a tweet that Pennsylvania alone of all the states that participated in the election, Pennsylvania alone may have invalidated 364,000 ballots because of illegally secretive counting. I'd actually never heard the phrase illegally secretive counting, even though I've been involved in elections uh, since 1980, uh, over 40 years ago. Uh, but uh, Rudy jumped right on it. And he said, no, 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 uh, it's not 364,000. It's more like 600,000 plus unlawful votes in Philly and Pittsburgh. Now let's see what the truth is here. Uh, so this is an article from PolitiFact. This is Giuliani's false claim of more than uh, 600,000 unlawful votes in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And here's a response from the Pennsylvania Department of State, which uh, has supervisory authority over elections in Pennsylvania. Uh, the former New York mayor's claim is unfounded. We found no rationale or explanation for how so many votes could have been fraudulently cast. There's no factual basis for this claim, said Agency Communications Director Wanda Murren. Allegations of fraud and illegal activity have been repeatedly debunked and dismissed by the courts. And that's been true in every instance with respect to the 2020 election. A U.S. District Court judge rebuffed a GOP suit that claimed Republican observers had been unfairly barred from certain areas of the Philadelphia Convention Center where mailed ballots were counted. Pressed by the judge, Republicans acknowledged that they did have representatives on the scene. So they lied about everything. They lied about whether there were representatives on the scene, and they lied about whether there were unlawful votes. OK, so who am I to be giving this talk? I think Kathleen let you in on some of it. Uh, I have been an examiner for eight states, most recently Georgia, 
where I was a consultant to Brad Raffensperger, who, who uh, obtained fame recently uh, by standing up to Donald Trump. Uh, I've testified before a bunch of congressional committees and states who were considering modifying their computer voting laws. Um, I've been an expert witness in 20 electronic voting cases uh, out of the hundreds, actually, I've been involved in, but 20 involved electronic voting, and uh, my side won every one of those. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy if anybody wants to make any further challenges, uh, all you need to do is hire me as an expert and we'll probably win. I also wrote a glossary of electronic voting, which is, contains definitions of thousands of terms that are used in the electronic voting field. So I, I know something about this. So one lesson I learned when I was young and I started doing these examinations, I was contacted very frequently by politicians who knew that I understood how computer voting systems work and they wanted, to, they wanted me to help them prove that the election had been stolen from them. And so I investigated a very large number of these cases and came to the conclusion in every one of them that there no chicanery had occurred. And so what I took away from this was that a losing candidate is willing to believe any reason that he lost, except that the voters didn't want him. Any crackpot theory you can come up with will gain some traction with a losing candidate. The good news is that it usually doesn't extend beyond the losing candidate and his family. And they're the ones who try to press their case in court and essentially never win. But they don't succeed in convincing large numbers of other people that the election has been stolen from. That's the big difference between then and now. For hundreds of years in the United States, claims of fraud were largely confined to unsuccessful candidates, not to huge masses of the populace. So here's another case of fraudulent voter fraud. This is Giuliani, but it's a different issue. Rudy Giuliani addresses voter fraud this election with state Senate Republicans. I'm not gonna read the whole article, but um, I'll, I'll read beginning with the red part. This election was lost by the Democrats. They cheated. It was a fraudulent election. They flooded the market. This is a very important moment in our country, said President Donald Trump. His lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, spoke at the hearing in Gettysburg. He claims there were hundreds of thousands extra mail-in ballots that were cast in the presidential election. You sent out in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania 1.8 million absentee or mail-in ballots. You received back 1.4 million. However, in the count for president, you counted 2.5 million. I don't know what accounts for the 700,000 difference between the ballots you sent out and the number of ballots that ended up in the count. Now, if you're a fan of Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani, this sounds like some very, very suspicious information. We ought to call the FBI and start getting an investigation going about what happened here. So what's the truth? Well, the truth was uh, <laughs> that the statistic uh, by Giuliani combined data from the primary election in which 1.8 million voters requested vote by mail ballots and data from the general election in which voters mailed back more than 2.6 million ballots. So it wasn't 1.8 million that were mailed out in the general election. It was 1.8 million that were mailed out in the primary election. And so the problem here is that there is some printed statistic somewhere that Giuliani can point to and say, oh, this is the number of mail-in ballots. He didn't make up the number 1.8 million. That really was the number of ballots sent out, but in the primary where very few people vote. Uh, so the fact is that more than 3 million uh, voters requested vote by mail ballots, uh, not, uh, not 1.8 million. Okay, counterfeit ballots allegedly cast in 2020 election. Georgia judge wants more information. U.S. Superior Court judge, there is no such thing, by the way, as a U.S. Superior Court judge. Um, it, it's a state court judge in Georgia. Uh, he was a state Superior Court judge in Georgia. Brian Amaro has asked the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the state's election investigators to submit information about the investigations conducted into allegations that last year's presidential election involved the use of counterfeit ballots. Amaro's request came as part of a lawsuit that seeks to inspect 147,000 ballots cast in the state's Fulton County, that's Atlanta, to determine whether or not incidents of fraud occurred. The lawsuit is based on accusations by Republican election auditors who claimed that they had reviewed pristine absentee ballots during the counting process post-election. Auditors observed that some of the ballots had perfectly filled in ovals and others had no fold marks, which might be an indication that they were not inserted into absentee envelopes because the absentee envelope is much smaller than the ballot you have to fold the ballot in order to put it into the mail. And so if there is allegedly an absentee ballot that is not folded, that would result in some suspicion, I would think. 
but let's look at the truth. Uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation did investigate. They were unable to find any counterfeit ballots among the batches identified by the Republican vote counters. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger said investigators reviewed 1,000 absentee ballots from batches in Fulton County that allegedly contained pristine ballots with perfectly filled in ovals and no fold lines. All ballots in those batches appeared to be legitimate. That means it was simply a lie that there were pristine ballots unfolded and with perfectly filled in ovals. The lawsuit, however, was based on sworn statements by four Republican election auditors who alleged that they saw suspicious ballots during a statewide audit that recounted every ballot by hand in November. So not only are we in a post-truth era where it's okay to lie to people, it's okay to swear false affidavits in court now. Now, what's happening is eventually people are beginning to pay the price. And uh, you know the disbarment of Giuliani is uh, is not far off. Here, here are a few more uh, fraud and voter fraud stories. Arizona Republicans hunt for bamboo-laced China ballots in 2020 audit effort. Among the conspiracy theories driving the exercise in Maricopa County is one that suggests 40,000 ballots were flown in from Asia. Let's even assume that 40,000 ballots were flown in from Asia. Would you expect to find bamboo slivers on them? Did they, I get what, did they fill them out while they were eating with bamboo chopsticks or something like that? I mean, this, this makes no sense ab initio. So the idea is, let's suppose you wanted to flood Election Central with 40,000 counterfeit ballots. Why would you get them from Asia? Just cook them up in your own garage. 2020 election fraud conspiracy theories remain central to many Republican campaigns. Now, that's an article from the Nevada Independent uh, last month. So uh, in this year and in ensuing years, they're going to keep fanning the flames of election conspiracy. Critics say Pillow Magnet's latest conspiracy is the most bizarre. Well, it's really difficult to choose a winner among the bizarre theories here. Mike Lindell says, I'm not wrong. I've checked it out. I've spent millions. Christina Jensen says, says she's been stopped on the street several times by acquaintances who wanted to share troubling news. Who's Jensen? She's the county clerk of Clark County in, in Wisconsin. Hackers from Beijing had switched nearly 24,000 votes for Donald Trump in their rural GOP-leaning Wisconsin county. Problem with that is there are only 17,000 registered voters in the county, and their election system is not connected to the internet. So there's no conceivable way that hackers from Beijing could ever uh, have interfered with that election. Okay, now let's look at some instances of real actual voter fraud that's not only been proven, but people have been sentenced to jail uh, for committing it. Um, this was uh, this year, 27 possible voter fraud cases in 3 million Wisconsin ballots. So Wisconsin election officials investigated and they found 27 potential cases of voter fraud out of 3.3 million ballots and forwarded them to the DA for prosecution. Let's see, more than half the cases came in a single city where 16 people had registered with their mailing address at a UPS store rather than their residence as required by law. Now it's true that that would invalidate their registration because they lied about their residential address. Why do you have to tell the registration authorities where you live so they can make sure that you're eligible to vote? People don't live in the UPS store. And so if you give that address, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a resident of the state. So 16 people voted under a fraudulent registration and they will be indicted and they will probably have to serve time. Okay, Pennsylvania man sentenced to five-year probation after voting in name of dead mother. I hope it was his own dead mother. He didn't pick somebody else's dead mother. Pennsylvania man has been sentenced to five years of probation after pleading guilty to casting a vote in the name of his deceased mother in an effort to reelect then President Donald Trump. Bruce Bartman, 70, received the sentence Friday after entering a guilty plea to two counts of perjury and one count of unlawful voting. Bartman will also lose his right to vote for four years pursuant to Pennsylvania statute. Okay, there's one extra vote for for Donald Trump in the, in the Pennsylvania election. Michigan officials charge three people with voter fraud, tell Trump supporters to stop spreading lies that fraud is widespread. 
Michigan's AG and Secretary of State charged three individuals who attempted voter fraud in the 2020 election. Let's look at the uh, last paragraph. Rainey, an employee at an assisted living facility, was charged with election law forgery and forging signatures on absentee ballot applications after she allegedly filled out applications for residents who had not told her they wanted to vote and forge their signatures. So presumably she's applying for voter registration for people in the old age home and that when the registration materials come back, she will request absentee ballots for those people. She will fill out those absentee ballots and she will fraudulently forge their signatures on the absentee ballots. So there's three votes that we, got, we have to worry about uh, in the election. All right. Well, of course, the biggest false claim is that the 2020 election was stolen. There's absolutely no evidence of it. Furthermore, there, no one has even posited a credible scenario by which it could have happened. Uh, I don't consider 40,000 ballots that might have bamboo on them a, a credible scenario. So no evidence has been adduced, even though people are claiming that they have mountains and mountains and mountains of evidence. When pressed to produce it, they can't produce it. The audits, even the partisan audit, for example, the one in uh, Arizona, revealed no significant discrepancies. And you'll remember that the, uh, the, the Trump favoring auditors actually found uh, 337 extra votes for Joe Biden uh, instead of votes that had been taken from Donald Trump. So what's, what's really going on here? Um, voter fraud is a subset of election fraud. So here's the taxonomy. Uh, there's insider fraud. Insider fraud uh, re refers to people who have legal access to the mechanisms of voting. So for example, people who print ballots, people who count ballots, people who uh, develop software for voting machines, people who actually administer the elections, people who handle the absentee ballots, and people who store the absentee ballots, people who store the electronic media that are used during counting. Those are insiders, and we kind of trust them. Because if we didn't trust them, there wouldn't be any way we could rely on them. Voter fraud uh, consists of fraud that's perpetrated by voters or people who are pretending to be voters. They have no other access to the mechanism of voting other than the same thing that ordinary voters do. So they can go to the polling place and they can do stuff at the polling place. They can request an absentee ballot and they can do stuff with their absentee ballot. They can sell it if they want to. It's illegal, but, but they can do that. That's voter fraud. And then outsider fraud is fraud committed by people who have no access to the mechanisms of voting. And so let's take a look at this. Insider fraud is election officials, poll workers, voting system manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera. Voter fraud are registered voters and impersonators of registered voters. Outsider fraud is everybody else. So dirty tricksters, people who just want to wreak havoc with the election, hackers, Russia, who knows what influence uh, those people may have had on elections. We're going to focus in today's talk on the voter fraud in the middle. So there's a big difference between wholesale and retail fraud. Wholesale fraud involves large numbers of ballots enough to change the outcome of an election. For example, if you could hack all of the voting machines in a city undetectably, then that would be wholesale fraud because you could make anybody you wanted win. Swapping 10,000 mail ballots might be enough. Uh, even in large jurisdictions, sometimes the margin isn't even as big as 10,000. You could swing an election that way. And altering computer vote totals. If you did it right, you might be able to commit wholesale fraud. There is no evidence that any wholesale fraud of this kind has ever occurred uh, in an American election. On the other hand, there's retail fraud. It involves only a handful of ballots, for example, a voter votes twice. This happens every election cycle, even for, during primary elections. There's somebody in the United States who votes twice. An ineligible voter votes, somebody taking the place of his dead mother, for example. The dead mother, dead people are not eligible to vote, so when they do, it's voter fraud. That also happens every election cycle. If you hacked one voting machine out of 300 voting machines, then that would probably be retail fraud because you would not affect a very large number of votes. Voting machines typically hold somewhere between 100 and 800 votes out of a huge jurisdiction. Allegheny County, for example, has thousands of voting machines. And so if you hacked one, you'd flip a few votes, but it would be retail fraud. Now, the truth is, occasionally we've had elections in the United States where a few hundred votes mattered. 
in the, 20, uh, the 2000 election, Bush Gore. It was 537 votes in uh, Palm Beach County, Florida. But there are checks and balances. And the United States has a very highly decentralized voting system. We have 50 states, the District of Columbia, territories and possessions, divided up into 3,142 counties and things that are equivalent to counties like parishes in uh, Louisiana are the equivalent of a county. Um, election administration is devolved down to individual counties. The counties have to pay for the voting equipment. The counties have to pay for the cost of the, for the, cost of the election. The good part is that there are 3,142 of them. And it's very difficult to get county clerks to conspire with one another to do anything to an election. There are actually 10,000 different voting jurisdictions in the United States. These are uh, bodies that have the authority to conduct an election. That includes, in many cases, school boards, uh, as well as counties and municipalities. The country is divided into 200,000 voting precincts, and there's a subtle difference between a precinct and a polling place, but let's treat them for today as being the same thing. So there are 200,000 places that people go to vote, and that requires 1.4 million poll workers to help them do the voting. And there are many different voting systems, even within the same state, there are many different voting uh, system and system types. So here is how the United States voted in the 2020 election. Uh, complicated map, but basically green is good and red is bad, at least according to an outfit called verifiedvoting.org, which, which uh, is responsible for really educating people about the, the differences in different kinds of voting systems and what they think is good and what they think is bad. You can see that mostly is green. And green stands for hand mark paper ballots. So anybody who voted in the uh, election that we just had last week voted probably with a hand-marked uh, paper ballot unless you were disabled, in which case you were provided with a BMD, a ballot marking device that has assistive interfaces that allow you to indicate your choices and it prints out a ballot that you have the opportunity to look at and make sure that it actually corresponds to your choices. And then that ballot is inserted into a machine just as it would be for somebody who was not, uh, not handicapped. Uh, and those hand-marked ballots are counted locally at the precincts, but they're also retained by the county so they can be used in case the recount is necessary. So they can be counted over again. Uh, and so most of the United States votes that way. Let's move down to Pennsylvania. So we only use three different voting methods in Pennsylvania, although we use many different voting systems from different manufacturers. So I've uh, marked in red some uh, prominent cities in the state. Uh, in Pittsburgh, we use hand-marked paper ballots. In Philadelphia, they don't. In Philadelphia, they use ballot marking devices. You don't ever get to draw the fill in the oval yourself. You go to a device and you indicate your choices on the device and the device prints out a ballot which you have the opportunity to inspect before you take it over into a tabulation machine. Um, there's a third form of voting, which is ballot marking devices for all voters, in which all you do is mark the ballot with the ballot marking device. It's not counted locally at the precinct, but is sent to County Central in order to be counted. That's what we do here. Okay, vote by mail. Vote by mail is a kind of a big change from the past. Uh, in the old days, if you wanted to vote by mail, you had to have a good excuse. You were going to be unavoidably outside the jurisdiction on election day. Uh, and you would swear to that in an affidavit, and then you would be sent an absentee ballot. Over time, what's happened is that we've become much more liberal about mail voting. So all states now allow some form of voting by mail. 45 states, including Pennsylvania, allow voting by mail with no excuse or a COVID excuse. In Pennsylvania, it's no excuse. You want to vote by mail, you get to vote by mail. Nine states uh, took it a bit further, and they think that voting by mail is so good that every voter ought to have the opportunity to do it, so they just send a, a mail ballot to every registered voter. Now, if you, if you send in a mail ballot, you can't then go to the polling place and vote on election day. <laughs> of course, in Oregon, you couldn't do that anyway because there are no polling places uh, in, in Oregon. Well, it's, it turned out that in 2020, 25% of the vote in federal elections was by mail. Now, mail is a potentially a problem because you fill out your ballot and maybe somebody's watching you, maybe somebody's paying you to fill the ballot out that way. 
you go and you mail the ballot, and then you don't exactly know what happens to it. Hopefully, the Postal Service will deliver it. But you know, Trump had some influence over that too. Uh, and so uh, let's assume that it gets to uh, the county. What do they do with it? Who's watching it between the time it was received and the time it gets counted? And when it does get counted, who does the counting? Who opens the envelope? Can they, if they can touch your ballot, they can change your ballot. This was a very old trick. This was reported many times in the newspapers. Uh, people who would count ballots in the old days would um, break off the end of a lead pencil underneath, underneath their thumbnail. And if they, as they were holding a ballot, if they saw it was voted for somebody they didn't like, then they would add an extra vote in that office and thus invalidate the ballot because it was overvoted. And so this has been known for uh, 100 years in the United States as a way of, of invalidating ballots. But at least there, you're in a polling place or something and you can watch and you can see, but you, don't, you can't really see what goes, what goes on at the county. Uh, so a vote by mail, while incredibly convenient, would raise some suspicion that there's a, at least a possibility of manipulating, of manipulating the ballots. Okay. Where are we? All right. So how do they actually count mail-in ballots? Now, in Pennsylvania has some real checks and balances on this. A record is made when you request a ballot. That's a public record. Uh, it's in a computer system. A public record is made when they send out the ballot. And a public record is made when they receive a ballot from you. So you can actually watch the process. Now, if they received a ballot from you, but they didn't mark it as having been received, then what? Did they receive it or did they not receive it? Maybe they received it, but they don't want to count it because they saw what zip code you're from and it doesn't correspond to the demographic that they would like in that zip code. There are possibilities. Now, what, what counters that possibility is that people don't work alone and the people who handle ballots are always being watched by other people who are handling ballots, which does raise the possibility of conspiracy among those people. And so we don't actually have any proof that there, there hasn't been manipulation of mail ballots, but we certainly believe there hasn't been any wholesale fraud involving them. Okay, so what happens? You can validate the voter from the outer envelope. So what happens is when you cast an absentee ballot, you put it in an envelope, and that envelope has no markings on it. You take that envelope and you put it in an outer envelope, which you sign with your name. And when that envelope comes back, to the county, they have to validate that you're a registered voter. If you are, then they make a mark in the registration system that you have voted. So if you actually go to a polling place, they won't let you vote because you already voted. Okay. They can open that envelope at that time before election day. That's fine because they're not actually looking in the inner envelope. Okay. Now, they can then look in the inner envelope. They can't count it, but they can look to see if there's anything wrong. For example, uh, it doesn't contain a ballot, for example, or it contains more than one ballot, something like that. Then they hold these all aside until election day. And on election day, they can actually begin counting the ballots, which they do by running them through a high-speed scanner, which you can see uh, on the uh, bottom right. On the bottom left, there are bipartisan teams that are examining the ballots. So there's somebody from each party. So presumably they're watching each other and nobody can do anything, uh, anything fishy there. All right. What is uh, the protection against unseen manipulations? Well, there's something called risk limiting audits. And these are statistical procedures that will ensure to a certain confidence level that the election results match the actual ballots. And this consists of recounts, selective recounts. The 100% recount, of course, you count every ballot. Slow, expensive. If you're willing to live with a 95% confidence interval, you don't have to count the ballots and statisticians are able to tell you how many ballots you actually have to count by hand in order to verify that to within 95% probability, the results of the election are correct. You pick the probability P and the statisticians will tell you how many votes, uh, how many ballots you have to look at. So how's a winner of an election actually determined? So I told you that we have a lot of polling places in the United States. We actually have 10,000 of them in Pennsylvania. In this past election, every ballot style in every precinct was different. There were no two precincts in the state that had the same ballot for a very simple reason, 
and that is judge of elections is a precinct wide office and a judge of elections can only serve as a judge in one precinct. So that means that the ballot style in every precinct is different depending on who's running for judge of elections. Okay, so what happens at these polling places? Well, there's a tabulator and you're asked to go over and slip your ballot into the tabulator. And then you see it goes through and it, it grabs it and it puts it into a bin and you go home because there's nothing else you can do. Except you could wait around until the end of the election that day when they'll actually print out locally, they'll print out the totals for that particular precinct. And that's what the election watchers do from the parties. They wait for that to be printed out and they immediately get on their cell phone and they tell party central how many votes we got in this particular place. Now, if there's any later discrepancy, it will raise tremendous suspicion because you know what was actually cast at the precinct. And if later on election central tells you it's different, then an investigation needs to be conducted. So what happens in these 10,000 polling places, every one of them is in some county. So we have 67 counties here. You can see Allegheny there. And what happens is ultimately the county boards of election have to determine the winner of each race. And what they do at the county is then reported centrally to the Pennsylvania Bureau of Elections, which sits under the Secretary of the Commonwealth, uh, which is an appointed position in Pennsylvania, although it's elected in some states. So the Secretary of State of Georgia is an elected position. The Secretary of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is not elected, is appointed by the governor and has to be confirmed by the legislature. And what does the Pennsylvania Bureau of Elections do? Well, this is the statute, 25 Pennsylvania statutes, 1416. The Secretary of the Commonwealth on receiving and computing the returns of the election of presidential electors shall lay them before the governor who shall enumerate and ascertain the number of votes given for each person so voted for and shall cause a certificate of election to be delivered to each person so chosen. So every elector for president in Pennsylvania gets a certificate from the governor saying, congratulations, you're an elector. And so the secretary of the Commonwealth tells the governor what the votes were. He takes a look, he signs the certificates of election and sends them to the presidential elector voters. Now, we voted for more than president. You can vote for Senate, you can vote for, for representative, et cetera. The Pennsylvania governor transmits the outcome of house races to the speaker of the US house and transmits the results of Senate races to the president of the Senate, which is usually the vice president. And the presidential electors themselves, not the governor, but the electors themselves transmit the electoral vote to the president of the Senate. And this is what caused the hullabaloo on January 6th, because that was where the, the official opening of the results of the electors was held. And the president of the Senate has a certain degree of authority over that proceeding. Okay, so here's what a lot of people consider a sad fact about voting systems. I just consider it reality. If the winning margin is small, there is no known voting system that can determine the outcome accurately. And the reason this comes up is that people are, are always looking at, well, are punch cards okay? Are uh, hand-marked paper ballots okay? Are voting machines okay? Which one is better? Okay, yeah, some of them are good and some of them are bad, largely uh, a result of human factors. On the other hand, there's not a one of them that can determine the outcome accurately. And there are many reasons for this. Humans make mistakes. Ballot layouts can be confusing. They lead people to make marks in places that they didn't intend to make marks in. And many cast ballots are actually completely uninterpretable. I'll give you an, an example here. Um, this is a fake ballot, but uh, there are seven races there. And I want you to look at each seven and tell what you think the intent of the voter was. It looks to me like, uh, that voter wanted to vote for Charlie Crist and Jeff Kotkamp because he drew a big oval around him. But unfortunately, he forgot to mark the required oval with there's no marking in there at all. That's not gonna be counted as a vote for Crist and Kotkamp because the scanner is looking for those little ovals to be filled in. Now, if there were a recount, however, in Pennsylvania, that vote would have to count for Crist and Kotkamp because Pennsylvania is what we call a voter intent state. When you review the ballots, the objective of the board is to determine what the intent of the voter was. 
Ballot scanners cannot determine voter intent. Look at the next one, same thing. Looks like he wanted to vote for Jim Davis and Daryl Jones, but there's no mark in the oval. The next one's a little problematical, underlining somebody's oval, maybe. Crossing somebody out certainly indicates that you don't wanna vote for them. However, part of that horizontal line goes through the oval, and that would be recognized as a vote for the candidate, even though the voter intended not to vote for the candidate. What happens if you write no in the oval? That seems like a clear denunciation of the candidate. However, of course, it will be counted as a vote because there's a mark in the oval. Yes, with triple exclamation points. Writing in Smith, that's nice. But if you don't mark the oval, that won't be counted as a write-in unless there's a recount. And so we, we, we know of no voting system that's really able to determine with complete accuracy the outcome of an election. And I showed you a slide before that uh, where you saw uh, a high-speed ballot counter. The ones we use in Allegheny County count 850 ballots a minute. The sad truth is if you take 50,000 ballots and put them through the ballot scanner and then you do it over again, you don't get the same result the next time. It's close, but there are issues on registration. There are issues on the reflectivity of the, of the ovals, so the marks in the ovals, what color ink did the voter use, uh, et cetera. Now you figure the ultimate would be, let's do a by hand recount. There can't be any possible error in a by hand recount. Well, of course there is, because what happens is they look at a ballot and the Republican says it means this and the Democrat says it means that, and they just don't agree on how that ballot should be, how that ballot should be counted. The next thing is that, can you imagine counting hundreds of thousands of votes with teams of people never making a mistake never once making an error, it's impossible. There is no known method of voting that will decide an election that has a small margin. Okay, now, happy fact is that if the winning margin is large, it doesn't matter what voting system you use. Every voting system is capable of telling who won if the margin is very large. And so whether a system is good or not, or whether your county should buy it, really depends on what value you ascribe to small and what value you ascribe to large. All right, voter fraud. These are different ways that people engage in fraud. False registration. I show up in a place, I'm not a resident of the place. Let's say I'm uh, there on vacation and I wanna become registered. So I lie on the registration form that I live in a particular place. I may actually get registered to vote in another jurisdiction and I might be able to vote there. Vote buying and coercion, uh, not so easy in, in polling places, but trivial with mail ballots. Um, impersonation at the polls. I show up and I pretend to be somebody else and I've practiced writing their signature a few times. And I happen to know that they're not gonna be voting because they're sick or they're, or they're out of the jurisdiction. I show up and I pretend to be them. Or I vote multiple times. There are all kinds of statutes about that. Multiple voting is usually legal if you're validly registered in more than one jurisdiction. So for example, uh, I can have a vacation home in a place and I'm resident there long enough for me to become a legal resident of that state. I'm also, let's say, a legal resident of Pennsylvania. I'm allowed to vote in both states, but I'm not allowed to vote in the same race in both states. So I can't cast two presidential ballots, but I can vote for senator in one state and senator in another state because they're different elections. So multiple voting is not always illegal. Now, every state prohibits voting more than once in the same election. So you, you can't vote for the same office twice, okay? 10 states, however, say, look, if you're registered in our state, you can't vote in any other state. And the 10 are listed there. Violation is usually a felony. It's, uh, election violations are quite serious. Well, illegal multiple voting by the same voter is extremely rare. Um, the state of Maryland and the District of Columbia compared lists of people who had actually voted at the polls. And the total number of votes involved was in the millions. Um, and they found that there were 13 people who had voted in both jurisdictions. And it's not clear that it was illegal for them to do it. So this reinforces my notion that actual voter fraud is retail fraud. It involves very small number of ballots that are actually below the threshold that any voting system is capable of distinguishing between. Impersonation. 
voter pretends to be a registered voter and votes on their behalf. The Washington Post investigated impersonation fraud claims over a period from 2000 to 2014, and they found 31 credible instances out of 1 billion ballots cast. I can guarantee you the vote scanner has not been made that can count a billion ballots twice and get within a margin of 31. Doesn't exist. Similar results were found at Arizona State University in 2012 and 2016. The Kansas Secretary of State, who actually is a proponent of voter suppression, he's a conspiracy theorist, he wants, he wants there to be conspiracy, was only able to find 14 instances of voter fraud out of 84 million votes cast in 22 different states, a fraud rate of so small, I, don't even, I can't even pronounce that. And then uh, the US Justice Department did a very similar study and they showed a fraud rate that actually corresponds very closely to Chris Kobach's fraud rate. So, so, so small. Outsider fraud, mail-in fraud, what do I do? I find out that you're not interested in voting because you've become disillusioned about voting. So what I do is I print up a form, I print up a ballot, I print up an outer envelope, and I sign your name to it. And of course, I take the precaution in advance of, of requesting a, an absentee ballot for you. And then maybe I wait at your home and I take it out of your mailbox before you get it. Then I don't even have to forge one, okay? Misinformation about voting hours. Uh, this is an old trick, very, very old, where you tell voters, you know, the weather's been really bad in November, we've had some snow. So they've decided to keep the election open for two days instead of one. You don't have to vote on Tuesday, you can vote on Wednesday. And these are people, of course, you'd like to disenfranchise. That, of course, is a crime, it occurs. But of course, it's retail. Manipulation of voting equipment, it's not impossible. Uh, voting machines are computers. Com all computers can be hacked. There's no evidence that anybody was ever able to successfully do it uh, in a, with a machine that was actually used in an election. Here's a mail-in fraud scheme. I, didn't, I just recently found out about this. I didn't, I didn't believe anybody would fall for this. So a fraudster who wants to uh, cast multiple votes goes house to house and says, are you an absentee voter? If you're an absentee voter, you don't have to walk to the mailbox and mail your ballot. I'll mail it for you as a public service. Then the fraudster steams open the envelope, replaces the ballot with his own ballot, which is very easy to print, seals up the envelope. The envelope has the true voter signature. So when it gets to the Bureau of Elections, they're gonna say, this is absolutely a genuine ballot that was cast by this person. Sometimes they're even able to inveigle postal workers to participate with them. And that they ask the postal workers to uh, throw ballots down the sewer that are coming from a ward, for example, that is known to vote heavily in one direction versus another. It, it happens, it works. Uh, it doesn't change the outcome of any elections, but it requires gullible voters and or fraudsters who are willing to engage in conspiracies and work uh, prison sentences for felonies. Of course, there are always people who do that, right? People commit murder, people commit bank robbery, and they're, they're uh, risking jail terms or, or execution. Coercion. An employer or spouse demands that the voter fill out their ballot in their presence. So my employer says, you wanna keep your job? You're gonna vote for Trump, and I'm gonna watch it. So I fill out my absentee ballot, and I hand it to him, and he puts it in the envelope, and he says, sign there, okay? If he's real nice, maybe he'll give me 25 bucks. 25 bucks, by the way, is the going price for a vote in the United States, in case you were curious as to how much it takes to buy a vote. It's different in different places, but generally 25 will do it, okay? Um, and, uh, or a party operative says, if you're really party faithful here, I want you to come and we're all gonna meet at night and you're all gonna fill out your ballots. Uh, and if you fill out your ballots right, I'm gonna pay all the, I'll give you all 25 bucks each and he watches and makes sure that they, get, that they get mailed. It happens, but it's retail. So to conclude, retail voter fraud exists. If there were no such thing as voter fraud, then it would be very difficult to propound conspiracy theories that it existed or that it happened. But voter fraud does exist. It's just a minor problem. The really big problem is fraudulent reports of voter fraud because all of those reports tend to involve supposed wholesale fraud, which really could 
uh, affect the outcome of an election. And with that, I conclude and invite questions. <laughs>